All right, so imagine for a second uh, you've just had a biopsy because your doctor thinks you might have cancer. Uh, they've stuck a fine needle into your thyroid or your pancreas or maybe down into your lungs to get a small sample of tissue to analyze to see if it's cancer, maybe what type, and if you need to start treatment. And you go home, you're waiting for the results, and when the phone rings, it's not the results, it's the scheduling people from the hospital asking you to come back again because they didn't get the sample they needed the first time. They basically missed. Uh, fine needle biopsies like this are great because they're minimally invasive. They don't have to cut you open. But they're essentially a blind procedure, and they can miss. And it's not uncommon for them to miss up to 20% of the time if confirmation isn't provided. And when that happens, it's a situation where everyone loses, right? The um, doctor's time has been wasted, your time has been wasted, the hospital and the insurance company have both wasted money. And this is cancer, right? So uh, diagnosis early, starting treatment early is everything when it comes to cancer. And what's most frustrating, really, is that all of this is entirely preventable. So my name's Tim Keller, and along with my co-founder, Dr. Alejandro Mendoza here, um, we've started AmSite to address this issue of unnecessary repeat biopsies. Our solution is a robot that lives in the procedure room that automatically processes the biopsy specimens, presents them to a microscope, which then con connects to one of our pathologists who are available on demand 24-7, to look at and determine whether or not you have the sample. Your doctor will know if they have the sample they need before you leave the hospital that first time. So you get the results you need earlier. If you need treatment, you tr start treatment earlier. Everyone saves time and money. Uh, up to this point, our work has been funded by the National Science Foundation, who has understood the importance of what we're doing. Uh, we're in the middle of building a robot, which I actually brought here, and it's half-assembled st stage. You can see it. It's working. It's beautiful. Um, even without the shell on it. Uh, we're launching a seed round right now, and uh, we expect that they'll have this technology in through the FDA clearance process and in the general market by 2025. So all that said, we could really use the backyard advantage. We're looking for people with experience in this field, potential board members, advisors, or even if you can introduce us to potential partners, customers, uh, and of course, equity investors. So. If any of that sounds interesting, please introduce yourself to myself or Alex, and we'd love to chat with you. All right, go ahead. Yeah, just question. Sorry. <laughs> I ran away too fast. Can you hear, can you hear guys okay? Great presentation, Tim. Thank you. Um, so just from what I picked up, it sounds like uh, this is a little bit of a decentralization play for the pathologist talent, right? You, with virtue of your technology, not every hospital would have to staff a pathologist because a remote pathologist can essentially do because you have the device in the local facility. Is that the right way to think about yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, right now, the way that you should be solving this problem is to have a pathologist in the room. But like in the last 20 years, we've been losing 1% of our pathologist workforce every year. So there's just not enough pathologists to do that. Yeah, great. Um, so um, wonderful technology. Uh, one of the things you may want to think about is most hospital systems and hospitals um, would have to implement a solution like this. And uh, no CIO I have known likes to take on new work. Um, and so as you think about implementation, you may want to consider coming up with a business model where you're amortizing the cost of implementation into your pricing. Uh, and that way you can offer a turnkey, no cost upfront implementation um, that you are willing to do for them, then that way it becomes nobody's job at, the, at your customer. Um, the second thing uh, I would say is uh, one of the things that most clinicians that you will be selling to, this is in my experience, uh, they love to look at clinical studies. Uh, and to the extent that you can come up with randomized clinical trials, um, double arm studies that prove the clinical effectiveness uh, and show an ROI that is north of 2x, um, that is sort of the activation energy you will require, um, that may really light up sales for your product. Um, this is based on some of the experiences we've had in our health system world buying pro products. Um, and the last thing you may want to consider is, as you think about your customers, uh, don't forget the smaller hospitals, because they are probably the ones that need it the most. They can't afford the talent. Yeah. Uh, but they probably won't have the dollars to pay for it. 
Um, and there are a lot of larger hospital systems that'll actually subsidize it because they want to build strategic alliances with the smaller ones to feed business. Mm. Um, th th this is how the local health systems usually work. There's a feeder hospital and there's a larger hospital. And the larger hospital will pay the capital to the feeder hospital so that the larger hospital gets business. So something for you to think about. Interesting, cool. That's great, Tim, I agree, a great presentation. One of the things I was thinking about is the AI ML implications. So yeah. there's a big transition, machine learning for pathology because it, the machine learn a lot quicker and more accurate than the pathologist. So adapting, so looking at your technology is that how do you phase in the AI ML component versus a um, you know, portfolio of pathologists that are remote looking at it, yeah. so. Yeah, our approach there is carefully, right? The, uh, nobody wants a computer telling you you have cancer, but there's things like you know, finding the, the clumps of cells on the slide that AI can direct you towards. And so um, when you use AI, it's suddenly a class three medical device rather than a class one. So we're going the traditional way and we'll be carefully implementing the AI components of what we're trying to do. Then you could adopt it, because it's always a pathologist who has to you know, certify it and sign off yeah. on it, yeah. but it's utilizing that technology so you're not lost out and just yeah. remote, so very good though. All right, good job. Thank you. Thank you.